We are a chosen generation We've been called for to show His excellence Dr. Pascal Magna, first of all, it's a great honor to, uh, to meet you, uh, to interview, interview you and to uh, hear your story. Um, I started this interview project four years ago. Uh, why? Because um, I wanted to share, I wanted to create role models for um, many people in the world, many dental professionals uh, who don't have access, access to these people. Mm -hmm. So I created this uh, interview series in cooperation with Loveline magazine to share these uh, stories. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, can you tell me who Pascal Magne is? <laughs> first of all, thank you, Marat, for including me in this, uh, in this project. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to contribute. And I'm, of course, very honored to be, to be considered amongst those, those persons that you, you have considered for this, uh, for this interview. Uh, who is Pascal Magne? Um, it's a difficult question. Uh, hopefully I know who I am, right? <laughs> and I think uh, Pascal Magne is a little Swiss guy born in a, in a place, uh, in a small city, a small town in, in, in Switzerland called La Chaux de Fonds. And uh, it's interesting because uh, as soon as I was born, uh, I was struggling with my life, uh, believe me or not, but I had difficulty just uh, being fed. And uh, my mother uh, was feeding me uh, 12 times a day in order to prevent uh, the food she was giving me to be rejected. And uh, it, was, it was very intensive for my parents uh, to do that with a small baby. I was, I'm the third child. I have a brother eight years old, older than me, and a sister 10 years older than me. Uh, my brother, everybody knows, is Michel. Maybe you will have a chance also to interview him if it's not done already, but uh, he has also a very interesting story. And, and then uh, from this first miracle uh, of my uh, early life, then uh, I became uh, little by little the Pascal you know with a few other mir miracles, that means... Uh, getting also involved in a huge car accident and having not even a scratch mm. on my skin. My car was destroyed completely and I just had basically nothing. And that's another thing. So I think God has been uh, taking care of me always in my life. And uh, it's interesting because I never uh, had in plan to be... Uh, traveling around the world to be sharing my profession around the world with uh, so many people and it's just happened uh, God again bless me with uh, the right encounters the right people in my life and uh, this is why I'm here today with mm. you sitting and I think it's uh, it's it's a blessing Incredible. and uh, what we are about to share in this interview I think I'm I'm just a messenger, you know. Mm. God is my path and, and is, has helped me find who I am today. And uh, he gave me, I think, a message to share Amazing. along the way. Uh, you spent two years as a full-time research scholar in biomaterials and biomechanics at the University of Minnesota mm -hmm. between uh, 1979 right. uh, and 99. How would you describe this experience? Yes, yeah, so between 97 and 99, those two years, uh, was uh, a very important time of my uh, career development because it happened that after, uh, you know, uh, eight years after graduating, I had made great things with Michelle. Uh, we had made already a, a number of lectures and speaking internationally, but my activity one was mainly based on clinical work. And I needed really the research part. Mm. Uh, I needed the, the scientific side of this work. And Professor Belzer 
told me, now you need to make a decision. Where are you going in the future? If it's clinical, you, you, know, you are more going to go to private practice. If you are interested in the academia, you really need to develop the research route. And that's what I decided. I said, you know, the academia is, uh, is unique. It's a unique opportunity. If you go to the academia and it doesn't work, you can always go to private practice. But if you go to private practice and then you want to go to the academia, it's much, much more difficult. So I, I really opted for the academic. And knowing that, then I had to really develop my research activity. So I, I went on a search of where would be the best place to do uh, research, and my heart was really in biomaterials and biomechanics. And in Minnesota, I found the most advanced lab. Mm. And until today, my research uh, program is based on what I learned in Minnesota in between 97 and 99. And so we do uh, what we call mechanical testing, fatigue testing of materials and restorations. We do bond test, we do uh, uh, numeric simulation. And I developed, be, because of that research uh, seed that was planted by the way, by, I have to mention my second mentor. So, uh, second and third, if I can say so. My first mentor is my brother, Michel. My second mentor is Professor Belzer in Geneva. And the third one is Professor uh, Bill Douglas in Minneapolis, who gave me this research mm -hmm. knowledge. So until today, my research program is based on what I learned in Minnesota. And uh, I have developed my own visiting scholars. So the same way I visited Minnesota in, in those days, I have visitors visiting me mm -hmm. in my lab and young people who are super uh, motivated. They do uh, their PhD program, part of their PhD program with me, and then they go on to get their degree in their country, mainly people from Brazil, because there's a lot of talent in Brazil. What is the biomimetic approach? Huh, the biomimetic approach. When people ask me this question, I have a very uh, simple answer. To be a biomimetic dentist, you need to be in love with God's creation, the tooth made of enamel, dentin, dentin enamel junction, the pulp, the periodontal ligament, the bone. You need to be in love with the reference, the model, the intact tooth and its supporting tissue. Once this is the case, everything else will be towards respecting this uh, organ and then copying this organ when you need to repair it. And so biomimetic is first respect of the natural tissue and then uh, emulation of the natural tissue. And uh, there's hence the other word biomimetics and bioemulation, which is another uh, word that's used because of the bioemulation group that a lot of people know. So biomimetic bioemulation is basically the same thing. Uh, it means respecting and emulating nature with the materials that we have at our disposition every day in our practice. And what do we have? We have composite resin and ceramics and adhesive systems. And uh, bioemulation is really optimizing the use of those systems, composite resin, ceramics, adhesive systems, in order to save a maximum amount of to structure, but at the same time uh, have a biological, a functional, uh, mechanical, and of course aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, restoration. But what I like to say is biomimetics is not primarily driven by aesthetics. It's not. Aesthetics is the cherry on the top. It's the consequence of respect for biology, function, and mechanics. So mm. basically, that is what is bioemulation and biomimetics. Mm. What is your philosophy on teaching at uh, USC Dental School? So the, you see, I cannot be several persons. What I teach is what I practice. 
and what I uh, give as an education mm -hmm. when I travel around the world, it's all based on the same philosophy, the biomimetic approach. That means if I teach to, to students at USC, and basically when I joined USC back then, there was no uh, precise concept of adhesive dentistry like it is based on biomimetics. So that is what I brought there uh, with me is all the concept of, of bonding, uh, refining and uh, making manuals, student manuals, uh, reviewing the curriculum to introduce everything that was the result of this research uh, into the student clinics, uh, updating the tools, you know, there's many tools we need to do biomimetic dentistry. We need magnification, we need oscillating tips, we need specific adhesive systems, we need um, uh, sandblasting tools, uh, air abrasion. Uh, uh, so all, all the, the, the material that was needed has been implemented in the student clinic. And of course, our greatest effort recently has been implementing CAD CAM dentistry, computers, uh, uh, chair side CAD CAMs, uh, to have the student exposed to what is the present and future of dentistry. Mm. So this is basically what we, the philosophy we follow. And of course, you cannot expect every professor in, at my university to follow strictly those principles uh, because it's, it's almost impossible to calibrate everybody the same way, but we are trying and this is the goal, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when you give courses or when you are uh, teaching at, uh, at the dental school, what, is, what are your teaching methods? Mm -hmm. So there is different types of teaching that I do in, in the dental school. There is what we call the preclinical teaching. It's students that are the first, second year students. They are learning uh, the profession first in a simulation lab that we call the preclinical lab, right? So this is a, a specific way of teaching. For instance, I'm involved in the teaching of dental morphology, which is the best thing because uh, biomimetic, as I told you, starts with the natural teeth. And so you have to know the morphology mm. and the morphology in all its aspects. And so I developed a teaching strategy called 2D, 3D, 4D. And it's been published now and it's been recognized and uh, a lot of school are looking at it to emulate that method. And what it is, it's first using drawing as a, a first tool. Drawing is an important skill because the skills you need to draw are the same skills you need to do dentistry. It's about perception, visual perception. Mm. And we use the technique that was uh, presented by uh, Betty Edwards in her book, Drawing with the Right Side of the Brain. Uh, you know, the five perceptual skills, frame, uh, outline, elements, mm. highlights, shadowing, and gestalt to introduce morphology to the students. And once they draw teeth, we bring them to the next level, which is the 3D, and we do wax-up exercise. Now, they, uh, I, I like to call the wax-up a 3D drawing, basically. And once they master the wax-up, we bring them into the fourth dimension. And what is the fourth dimension? It's the layering. It's the depth within the volume. Mm -hmm. And so they learn about histoanatomy, shape of dentin and enamel. And then the other part of the teaching, which is once the students are in the clinic, is a, is a pure hands-on teaching, one-on-one, -on -one, treating patients according to all the principles that we discussed. So we do everything. We do from direct composite to indirect veneers. And I've even done, and I'm still doing, full mouth rehabilitations using adhesive dentistry with my uh, uh, regular, you know, dental students. This is not a specialty program. Mm. And a lot of people ask me, but uh, uh, should uh, aesthetic biomimetic dentistry be a specialty? My answer is no. 
aesthetic biomimetic dentistry is everyday dentistry. It's daily bread dentistry. Mm. It's, as, it's dentistry done right. It doesn't need to be a specialty. We have to teach that from mm. day one in the dental school. Mm. And I'm really excited because through morphology, through the course of uh, the preclinical, preclinical course of dental morphology and the clinical course, I've been able to implement those concepts in the regular student curriculum. Mm. So in which situation um, to choose ceramic veneers and in which situation composites? Mm -hmm. The choice <clears throat> should always be based, I would like to say, on four elements. <clears throat> There is first science. Okay, we know, I told you, the difference of those materials, ceramic, rigid, Uh, but brittle, composite, flexible, uh, but not wear resistant. Then there is common sense. That means sometimes you have, you deal with limitations, thicknesses, you deal with uh, conditions that will prevent you to use one material over the other. Then there is experience. You know, Very well. Some dentists are super experienced with ceramics. Some dentists are super experienced with composite. You have the ceramic gurus. You have the composite gurus. And it's very important how much experience you have with, with a material or a technique. And finally, you have number four, the patient. So, you know, science, common sense, experience, and the patient. Mm -hmm. Maybe all the three other elements tell you this patient needs a full mouth rehabilitation with ceramic restorations with the CAT CAM system, but the patient has only $3,000 to do the, this whole re restoration. How do you do that expensive material for only that amount of money? So you have to adapt to the patient's need, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the decision tree. You need to you know your material. You need to you know how much experience you have on the material. Use your common sense, look at the patient's limitation, and then you come to a decision. Mm. But it's difficult to say, to give a universal recipe, because for one dentist in his practice with this type of patient he has, the choice will be, the choice will be different than this other dentist with his different experience and the different type of patient he will have. Yeah. Who were your mentors in your journey yeah. of becoming yeah. becoming a dentist? Exactly. So about mentorship, I told you already. I've had three major mentors. Um, my brother uh, first, of course, because he influenced my decision to become a dentist because I saw him uh, first. Then, of course, Professor Belzer, who I call my clinical mentor, and then Professor Douglas, who I call my research mentor. Right. So. A mentor, what is a mentor? Is a dental father, or of course it could be a mother also. Yeah. Uh, it is a person who is a, a, a professional parent. And uh, I always like to joke with my students, I say you cannot choose your real father or your real mother, but you can have a choice about your professional father or mother. And so... I really encourage young people to find their mentor. And of course, I'm very honored when the student come to me and say, I want to be your mentor. I try to have as many mentees as possible. And the beautiful thing about mentorship, it's like having a family, right? When you, are, when you get married, then you have children. And I think that's exactly the same experience I'm having with my profession. Now that I'm old enough, I have professional children, my mentees. And the most beautiful thing is to see them grow, your dental children, and then become themselves one day a mentor. Yeah. And some of them, I'm so proud of them because they already, you know, on the lecture circuit, they've learned so much and uh, they practice everything we taught them by the words and then they give their own twist mm. and their own novelties and they become influential themselves. And what is the best advice you ever received? The best advice I ever received. Well, the best advice I received and that I followed 
is yeah. precisely <laughs> to let God enter in my life. And I know it seems a little bit um, maybe uh, extreme to say that, but uh, life, you know, life is beautiful. We are, you know, we live in a body that is a physical body, but I realized, and you know, when I was 29 years old, I realized that I'm more than just a physical body. I have a soul, I have mind, uh, my own mind, but I have a spirit. And so this discovery uh, was the best thing that happened to, in my life. I cannot say it was someone specific who gave me the tip, because I think it's God's spirit works in everybody's, uh, uh, in everybody's spirit. It's just some person are ready to open the door and some person are not ready to mm. open the door. And when I was 29 years old, I was ready to open the door to God. And that's what I did. And I discovered the spiritual world that I had no clue before. And today I can say it would be foolish not to consider that this world is not only a physical world, it's also a spiritual world. And when you see the world, when you see what is happening in the world, and when you see the war, the wars going on in the world, it's the, it's the proof that it's not only physical, there is a spiritual, there is religion, there is a lot of thing happening. This is beyond the physical world. To me, it's obvious. I see to many people it's not obvious yet, but time will reveal. Mm. And as my brother say, says, because he's also a very spiritual person, time always reveals the truth. Mm. And I think time will reveal the truth about the true, uh, the true life, which is also spiritual. Mm. Uh, your, I, I saw your lectures a couple of times, and um, it's, 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 yeah, it's a very high level. Um, and you are in inspiring also many masters because I've interviewed now Kayashi mm. and he told the story that um, first time he saw your presentation, I have the, I have the interview, I, you can mm. read it. Mm -hmm. He went back to his car and he started crying. Mm. Why? Yes. Because he saw that uh, you had such a high level that mm. he, he had to uh, work on it mm. to mm. have this wow. high level. So Yeah. How do you manage to, to mm. have these high-level uh, lectures? <laughs> wow, that's, uh, yeah, this is very, um, I'm very touched to hear that because I have such a high regard for Naoki Ayashi and what he's doing. He's definitely uh, on, on the top of the game right now <clears throat> in, his, uh, in his work. Uh, what he's doing is, is absolutely fascinating. And I, I would like to say that, no, it's not by myself that I, 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 I had the level that he said I, I, I had when, when he, he cried about it. I'm so touched that this, is hap this happened. But it's a combination. It's a, it's a, you know, I wouldn't have been doing this presentation without, for instance, my brother, without the research I did, without... Professor Belzer giving me the opportunity. Mm. You see, so I owe this to many people, all my mentors or first of all. And then, of course, the most important, I owe this to God who opened my eyes in so many things. So, yes, I would like to say I feel sometimes more as a messenger than the main actor. In these things, because mm. it's a it's a teamwork, it's a, uh, it's circumstances, it's uh, many things together, mm. and but above all, of course, I have to say it's also passion, and if Naoki is where he is now, it's because he's deeply passionate about what he's doing too. Mm. What does quality mean uh, in your in your work? Mm -hmm. Quality means that you can read through the result of your work, you can read the passion 
of the, the one who did it, you know? You can read the love. And, and, and when I see my student, when I look at their work, you know, it might not necessarily be the best work, but I can see their efforts. Huh? And quality is different for everybody because it's a subjective thing. Uh, I know as a human being, we try to define quality with criteria, with lists uh, of, of, of criteria. And uh, it's difficult for me to do that because I see each student differently with different capacities. And so my challenge as a teacher is to evaluate quality because uh, for some students, you have to read differently than another one. And quality is, as I said, is, is how much I can see the passion and the love for the work in the result. And sometimes, again, it's not necessarily looking perfect. Quality is not necessarily perfection. Mm -hmm. It's passion and love. Incredible. Mm. Mm. Um, what are your core, core values in ultra-conservative dentistry? So the core value in conservative dentistry is very simple. <laughs> Less is more. Mm -hmm. Less is more. With the biomimetic principle in mind, what do you have? Do you have, you have the natural tooth, you have natural tissue, you have uh, intact tissue and you have diseased tissue. So the basic fundamental principle is to be able to restore the tooth without removing any intact tissue, right? And I think we have achieved that already, but we can do better. We can be even better. You know, it starts with <coughs> caries removal. Uh, uh, of course, before that, even it starts with prevention huh? mm. and prophylaxis. Uh, that's the very beginning. But once there is disease, the basic principle should be to remove the disease only without having to remove anything else. And that's not been the principle of restorative dentistry in the past. We know that. Mm -hmm. We've been doing horrible things, uh, damaging natural tissues in the sake of restoring the tooth. And now this is finished. So the principle of conservative adhesive Minimal invasive dentistry is disease only must be removed and everything else that's intact should be remained. Mm. That should be the principle. Uh, what is your perspective on failure? Failure is how we learn, right? So failure is very hard to take for your ego. It's uh, very frustrating, but... Again, as I said before, uh, when something bad happens, you can complain about it, you can be depressed about it, you can lament yourself about it, or you can say, okay, what did I do wrong and what can I learn from it? Mm -hmm. And once you change this attitude, failure becomes something positive. Because who are we? We are human beings who fail every day. <laughs> the Bible <laughs> called this sin. <laughs> huh? You know what is the definition of the word sin? The definition of the word sin is in Hebrew to miss the mark. Mm. So every day you we miss, miss the, mark. the mark because this is how we are since the original sin. So failure is part of life. And it's very, I, I love that you ask me this question because... I deal with that problem all the time with my students. Students complain always when you give them a bad grade. And they come, and they lament, and they complain. And I tell them, rejoice. Failure is how you learn. If I give you 100% grade, what do you learn? Mm. Nothing. So failure is part of life. And uh, I think every time a patient calls me, and says, mm, I had a problem. Of course, my first reaction is, ah, bummer. But then I'm like, ah, let's see what happened. What can we learn from it? I think it's your, failing is impossible to avoid. It's how you deal with failure 
that's, that makes the difference between, I think, someone successful or someone is not mm. successful. Mm. Suppose you have one day free and some, someone else has to take your place and be you. What, are, what, are, what qualities do that person need to have? Very simple. Passion and love. Those are the qualities I'm expecting from. And I think it's, if someone is passionate, if someone loves what he's doing and the others, this person will always do the right thing. Mm. And the last question. Mm. Um, suppose this was your last day on, on earth. Uh, what would you like to share with the people who are continuing? <laughs> <laughs> well, if this was my last day on earth, let me tell you, you know already what I'm going to tell you. I would tell people, God loves you. God cares about you. I tell you, if that was my last day on earth, I would not share about dentistry. I would not share about uh, technology, about anything else than God. And I would tell the people, You know, please meet your creator now. Don't wait. The, God, the, the world is going crazy. Everybody can see that. And the times are counted, I think, for humanity. Mm. Um, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I think that uh, if, you, if you are spiritual and if you read the Bible, you will see that the world is accelerating now in, in its evolution and that... If this is my last day, I want to tell the world, don't worry about me because where I'm going, I know exactly what to expect. And I hope the same for you. So don't wait to discover that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> where he says I'm at, I know who I am.